Thank you. Are we going to face a cutoff of Russian gas to Europe uh, this fall or winter? The possibility is great. Uh, the Ukrainian state energy company, Naftohaz Ukraina, is broke, in fact. They, they managed to meet their last two payments to Gazprom because a new emission uh, was done uh, by uh, the Cabinet of Ministers. They're short. Approximately $1.3 billion is what they need to buy the technical gas uh, in order to pump gas from Russia into Europe this winter. They don't have that money right now. The EU has put that as a precondition for a loan from European banks that uh, not the gas Ukraine reform itself, restructure itself, that the domestic price of gas in Ukraine arise and that the subsidies that go to Ukraine from the state to consumers from the Ukrainian government for gas be ended. It doesn't look good. I don't think anybody today in Ukraine is going to raise the price of gas to the population prior to a presidential election. It doesn't look very good. And it doesn't look good for Europe then as well. So they better roll out the blankets pretty soon in uh, Sofia and other places. What are, you th what are your views on this? Is this, can it happen? What will be the consequences of another uh, blockade of, of gas to the EU? I'll say quickly, I think it's very likely, in fact, that it will happen again, because what we are speaking about here fundamentally, I think, is, uh, is tensions among uh, elites that are interested in, um, well, lining certain pockets. And uh, those personal interests uh, get in the way of national interests, and they get in the way of the interests of the European Union and, and its energy security. Uh, and that goes fundamentally to the question of the way in which a company such as uh, Gazprom is uh, put together and the way in which its intermediary companies that it uses in Ukraine, for example, and within the European Union uh, act as uh, essentially ways in which to uh, allow money to flow to personal coffers as opposed to uh, anything that is transparent. And so as long as you have a system in which uh, you have a uh, Kremlin-controlled arm of the state, Gazprom, uh, that is intimately tied to personal interests, uh, that is at the same time creating uh, non-transparent entities that are, for whatever reason, and this goes back to the European Commission's uh, uh, powers, not being uh, broken up as they ought to be within the U European Union. Uh, entities that uh, uh, allow for a fog, if you will, over transactions to do with energy. Uh, there will be energy cutoffs because there will be tension among the individuals that are fighting over uh, how much it is that they can line their pockets. Um, that's the fact of the matter. I think we ought not to lose sight of that. Uh, at the same time, consequences of this, uh, consequences being that we may well see another uh, frozen winter in Sofia. We may well see uh, what we increasingly are seeing now, uh, Eastern European countries uh, actually attempting to diversify. It may, may be too little too late, but the positive spin side of it, even though we may see another cold winter this year, is that, for example, uh, the Bulgarian government uh, the previous one, just before these last elections, uh, fairly content to be 100 percent dependent on Russian gas, fairly content to have um, significant ties in a number of areas uh, to Gazprom, intermediary companies, uh, and the Russian government. Uh, now the new government has decided to uh, tap into the uh, uh, Italy, Greece, Turkey interconnector pipeline. Uh, and now I think the, the idea is that that uh, interconnector to the interconnector, if you will, that would go up to Bulgaria and allow for uh, one BCM of natural gas from Azerbaijan to diversify Bulgaria's consumption. 
uh, should be finished by uh, 2013, I think was the, what was last said, although maybe realistically a little bit more given that the ITGI, the interconnector from Turkey to uh, Italy through Greece, will likely be finished by 2012. Um, but that project is a direct consequence of what happened last winter, or this, this past winter. Uh, and it is not only something that I think is increasingly demanded uh, by populations in countries like Bulgaria. The uh, result of the elections, I think, is no, uh, uh, it's no small piece, that, that energy piece, uh, in the outcome. Uh, and there's a growing realization, in my mind, not only in countries such as Bulgaria, but even, in fact, in speaking with colleagues in Berlin, uh, that Russia is increasingly not that reliable partner for the countries that chose uh, in the past decade or so, instead of diversifying and finding alternative routes uh, to the countries uh, that are now part of the EU's Eastern Partnership, uh, to instead increase overdependence on Russia uh, and create a sort of partnership. I think that those partnerships are now uh, uh, beginning to disintegrate. Uh, and if we are to have a cutoff this winter again, uh, that process will only be speeded up in my mind. I would just add a comment to that. Uh, I tend to agree, though, with the EU that Ukraine needs to take some steps of its own in order to avoid, uh, not only avoid cutoffs, but also to attract investment from the European Commission and, uh, I think, a, a more secure supply of energy. Uh, these reforms that the EU wants uh, Naftogaz to, to uh, embark on, I think, are, are correct. Uh, Ukraine itself needs to do a lot more to attract Western investors. Right now, uh, Ukraine generally tends to, uh, the Ukrainian officials and the energy monopolies uh, there are doing everything they can to keep out Western companies. Western companies that go to Ukraine, good transparent companies, face an awful lot of roadblocks. And in fact, there doesn't seem to be any uh, concerted effort on the part of Ukraine to attract good, solid, transparent Western investors. And that has to change. At the same time, the European Commission itself uh, tends to, there have been West Europeans who tend to believe the, uh, the, the Moscow line that Ukraine is stealing its gas. And therefore, that's the whole issue is one of uh, gas theft. Well, you know, when, when Russia really controls the metering system of gas going in and out of Ukraine, and when uh, the Russians control a lot of the internal market, Gazprom does, and when your ambassador to the country is the former CEO of Gazprom, you know exactly what's going on in Ukraine. And so there is no stealing uh, of gas uh, without the connivance, really, I think, of the supplier. So I think that's something that I keep in mind. But I think the transparency and uh, increased uh, attraction of Western investors is crucial in the long run. But, uh, yeah, there may be, well be another cutoff this year, and I think that uh, it'll, it'll hurt both Ukraine and Russia. If, if I may just add another point. Let us not lose sight. Uh, you know, we spoke about uh, lack of transparency, intermediary companies, so on. Let us not lose sight of the geopolitical aspect of this. Uh, although there are important personal interests involved, uh, there's a reason why uh, Ukraine is being targeted. Uh, there's a reason why President Putin thinks it's, uh, <laughs> excuse me, Prime Minister Putin is, uh, is, uh, feels that it's appropriate to go to the border and say, you know, open up the gas valves. Right? This is not something that generally uh, uh, former heads of state uh, do uh, in positions uh, such as Putin's at the moment. Um, there is a message being sent, not only to Ukraine uh, in terms of its ambitions for eventual European Union membership, but also a message being sent to individual European Union member uh, consumer states uh, that if you do not, if you do not lock into a so-called partnership for gas with Gazprom and Moscow, that there will be consequences. Um, it's an enormously 
Uh, it's it's a sort of a tight rope 